development is too fragile, it's too, uh, it's still too, uh, too weak, the infrastructure long line, so we shouldn't use it yet. WikiLeaks initially listened, but then in the middle of 2011, they, right here on this move from $1 to $30, uh, WikiLeaks had no choice and they accepted Bitcoin as donations. That's actually when I first heard about Bitcoin. Uh, a bigger event happened during this time that drove Bitcoin price in its biggest bubble in history from $1 to $30. And that was events in New York and the senator in New York, Chuck Schumer, uh, I wish I could play this video but unfortunately it's not on YouTube due to copyright, uh, which I'm also not a fan of, but it's a discussion. Uh, so he went on TV, took out like a, uh, like a one minute uh, ad in the CNBC where he talked about this crazy website called Silk Road, how everyone is buying drugs from it with this anonymous currency uh, called Bitcoin using this crazy Onion browser called Tor. So this was probably the greatest 30 second tutorial on how to anonymously buy drugs on the internet and have them sent to your house. Uh, so on this event, the price of Bitcoin shot up to about from one dollar to thirty dollars. The traffic on Silk Road went through the roof uh, because no one had really heard of it until this point. Until you have a senator going on TV and telling everybody about it and how to use it. Uh, so that really, really helped Bitcoin in its early days. Uh, next, in 2012, we had China joining in on the Bitcoin exchanges. Uh, the initial Bitcoin exchanges were in New York. These were the Bit Instant, Charles Schrems Venture, uh, Trade Hill was an exchange out of uh, California. I believe there was one other one. But in 2012, China joins the game, and uh, the Chinese are now having this appetite for gambling because they were suppressed for so long. Uh, and Bitcoin is perfect. You don't need any verification. You can just go and start experimenting with trading. Um, and that helped drive Bitcoin adoption and price a little bit. But it was 2013 that things really took off. Remember, the very first Bitcoin exchange was out of Japan. That was Mount Gox. And now, in hindsight, we know that in early 2013, uh, Mount Gox had this bot called WillyBot that was kind of trading and spoofing the price, driving it up. Now, of course, nothing is, uh, you can't, um, call a crash or a huge rise in prices, it's never one event. It's always a culmination of events. So when we start 2013, there were several things. Also the halving took place. This was the first time the Bitcoin reward got cut in half. That was a very important day because it was the very first halving and you really had to trust the code that it would actually get cut in half. Uh, if it didn't get cut in half, the market could have tanked back to a cent because the confidence would have been lost. Uh, once the having worked as expected, confidence got brought into the system. Uh, the Willy bot gets kicked off in early 2013 because Mount Gox was probably hacked in 2011 and they were stealing uh, their money out of cold storage. So much for cold storage. Uh, so they had to spoof the price and try to make it look better than it was. And uh, so that was part of it. The other part of it was the events in, uh, in Europe, specifically Cyprus. This was the first European country and some people uh, call it the test case, where the banks got shut down and any bank account over $100,000 got taxed at 40%. So all the money above 100,000 ended up being taxed at 40% uh, and 40% got taken away uh, from all bank accounts over with the amounts above 100,000. Uh, so the banking system got shut down. This was around the time where I literally got up off my chair and said, you know what, that can't actually happen in any Western country and it's time to go out and find some Bitcoin. So I, I came to the scene a little later than I should have, considering I knew about it in 2011, but better late than ever. Uh, and I was telling people at work, I work in the financial sector, where I said, hey, this can happen here, and they're all laughing, no, this can't happen here. But, uh, well, we will see. The price rose to 250, then crashed around for a bit. We had an incident right here where it dropped in one day from 120 to 85. Uh, this was the day that Silk Road was eventually shut down. Uh, and I remember one of my coworkers came up to me laughing. I mean, even though they knew I never used Silk Road, I never cared for it. Kind of wish I did. I probably would have got into Bitcoin much earlier. 
Um, but I didn't, then one of my coworkers up to me and starts laughing. He's like, hey, so Crowd was shut down. What, no, what are you gonna use your Bitcoins now? Right, that, that, was the, that was the mentality. It's like, oh, what are they good for? Um, actually, today, uh, the, uh, the gray narcotics market is bigger than ever. Uh, it's bigger than Silk Road ever was across all the other similar websites. And also, if you really dig into the statistics, the majority of drugs purchased on Silk Road were prescription drugs, medication for uh, HIV, medication for uh, some cancer, basically because they can get them much cheaper from other countries. Um, and uh, so we had this huge rise going into 1200. Again, there were several things happening here. Uh, the Japanese exchange is pretty much dying. That's found Gox that died all the way at the end. The US exchanges are shutting down. Charlie Shrem gets arrested. Uh, Trade Hill shuts down. And China becomes the main player in uh, volume with a few other exchanges. Uh, Bitfinex is coming online. Uh, BTCE, who's still opening those who runs it, um, are still around. Um, but that was basically the very quick history of the rise. Now let's talk about the fall. Uh, so ever since then, so what's happening here on this rise, uh, there was a lot of demand for Bitcoin relative to where you can spend these Bitcoins. And this is where a lot of companies are starting you here at all. Expedia now accepts it, Dell Computers now accepts it. Uh, who else was the big one? Uh, Direct TV now accepts it, but it's still very, very small. But a lot of the merchants are coming online here and now all these people have made money and now they want to spend it. And at that time, I remember being in a debate, uh, that's me over there on the left, in a debate article where I said, if uh, PayPal begins to accept Bitcoin right now for all merchants using PayPal, watch the price of Bitcoin crash back to about $10, $20, because that is the formula, that's my formula for Bitcoin supply and demand. Uh, it's very basic economics. Demand is actually new users coming in and buying Bitcoins. But what is supply? Well, supply is actually two things. There is, we all know that Bitcoins are still being mined, so new Bitcoins are coming into circulation. That's one type of supply. The other supply is merchants that don't care about Bitcoin accepting Bitcoin. Uh, those Bitcoins immediately go on the open market for sale. Uh, that creates a major supply of Bitcoins because those that are using Bitcoins to buy stuff, they're not going to be going back out and buying them back. That makes no sense uh, because they're paying a percentage on both ends to buy them back and to spend them. Uh, so uh, this is, the problem becomes that if you, have, if you have merchants that accept Bitcoin and hold on to Bitcoin, try to pay their employees in Bitcoin, try to push them up the supply chain, that is great. But when you have businesses that just put a Bitcoin logo on it saying we accept Bitcoin, but they clearly don't care or they legally can't hold on to it, uh, that's not demand for Bitcoin, that's supply of Bitcoin, uh, which would actually drive the price lower. And I was in a lot of debates because some people still don't believe that that's the case. All right, so let's talk about how bubbles fall, right? So we had this big crash. I, I, again, I'm running, I don't have much time to talk about this, but this is a stereotypical uh, type of a bubble. Uh, you have the uh, awareness phase, the mania phase. Uh, it's questionable whether Bitcoin has made it to the mania phase yet. I personally don't think it has because this chart can repeat several times over and over again. Uh, but if you look, I have Bitcoin is in blue right here, but now it's a linear chart, not a logarithmic chart as the big one before. So that's why you have this giant rise right here. Uh, and it's on a backdrop of another asset. The back asset happens to be silver. And, uh, and if you match up these peaks and how it holds, um, the, the fall in prices is almost identical. It's just that Bitcoin is doing it three times faster. Uh, this is about six months old now, haven't had a chance to update, uh, but it's finally starting to diverge. And I believe going forward, Bitcoin will be the leader and uh, silver will be the follower. Meanwhile, if you wanted to cut the tie, of course, hindsight is always 2020. but if you had an idea at the time, well, Bitcoin followed the movements in silver identically, only did it uh, three times faster. So it did it in the last year and a half, 
what silver has done in about three years and change, three or four years. Uh, but uh, the correlation is uh, of the moves, you can like, clearly see it in this chart right there. Red circle matches up to red, purple to purple, uh, red here to red there, this big last, last spike, uh, and then this, this guy right here matches up really well, and then you have these lower highs. All right, so what are we looking into the future? I have a few minutes. Um, I believe the real adoption of Bitcoin is gonna happen in the same region where you can't even get 30 people to a Bitcoin event, and that's uh, Central Europe. Uh, because I, and again, the first time I gave this presentation was in February, and I specifically zoomed in on Greece, and I don't think I'm ever gonna remove it, because back in February I said, just watch what happens when the Greek banking, uh, banking sector shuts down uh, sometime this summer. Uh, and people will realize how important Bitcoin really is. Uh, and it was Greece, the next one I'm expecting to do the same thing would be Italy. I'm expecting Italy to have a bank holiday, but they are really competing with Spain over who's gonna have the next bank holiday when the bank shut down and uh, money taxed and confiscated. Uh, but France and Germany, they're not in much better shape. Uh, the free movement of people is already shutting down due to the migrant crisis. Um, I just see this region getting perpetually worse and worse with their socialist, socialist uh, financial banking systems. So what happens when people finally realize it? Well, historically, people just got up and moved. Um, I, I, just, I use this picture because it looks cool. In reality, people from France aren't really going to migrate to England because England is almost as bad when it comes to money and, uh, and banking and socialist programs. Uh, so where are they gonna move? They're gonna move to more freer regions. And these are just some of the examples of what is happening. So this is a mayor candidate uh, running for mayor, uh, being uh, advocated by Max Kaiser, who's a Bitcoin guy. Uh, but look at some of his policies. He wants to run uh, Uber out of town. Uh, that's right here, Uber out of town. He wants to take away property uh, from uh, people that haven't lived there in over a year because a lot of people are moving their money into this region. And uh, just one quick note on hyperinflation, people think hyperinflation happens uh, because the government prints too much. It does not. Hyperinflation happens due to the loss of faith in the government and they resort to printing too much. So an idea of hyperinflation is the famous Zimbabwe. Hyperinflation in Zimbabwe started because they took away property from the rich people and decided to give it to the poor people. Rich people moved away and there was no confidence in the government. You resort to printing money. Uh, here is an example out of uh, Germany where they're declaring that everyone has to register any kind of a historical artifact that has more than 100 euros in value. So this basically means any art dealer, any, uh, um, any, any coin dealer, they're basically gonna get the hell out of Germany because they can be legally liable. This is all done because Germany feels that terrorists are now digging in archeological sites uh, to fund their operations. It's stated right there in their proposal for this law that I'm not sure passed or is passing. Uh, this is France, they, you're not allowed to buy anything with over a thousand euros in cash without a KYC process. Uh, and they snuck in Bit, a Bitcoin regulation at the bottom. They still don't understand what Bitcoin is, but it's just there. Uh, so you can't exchange more than 1,000 euros in cash without a KYC process. This is an example out of America that the war on cash is across all Western regions. Um, in Louisiana, there is a law that says you cannot buy secondhand goods with cash. So if you have a garage sale, you legally cannot sell your toaster for $10 without a KYC process. Uh, there is no minimum here. You can take a check, but you can't take the $10 bill. Uh, and uh, eliminating cash is great for government. I have three top reasons. One of them is they can set any monetary policy they want, negative rates, whatever. Uh, nothing can stop them. There's nowhere to hide. You can't have a run on a bank because there won't be any lines. You won't have these pictures like in Greece or in the Great Depression. You know, a thousand people out of line waiting for an ATM, $10, $20 bill. Uh, if there's no cash, you won't see that visual. And more importantly to the government, we're all tax dodgers. Um, so this would make sure that none of us are hiding a $20 bill to avoid taxes. Uh, so those are my personal top three reasons. Uh, taxes are also going up. There's some kind of law in New Jersey about an exit tax. 
Uh, I've seen several articles of no one can understand how it actually works. I went on Airbnb to get a place when I was going to a conference in North Carolina, and I noticed why does this why does the price look different? All of a sudden, I'm paying about $25 more because Airbnb suddenly added taxes uh, to their system. And North Carolina is a pretty pretty good state when it comes to taxes. And look at all these taxes that were tacked on to Airbnb. At the same time, I had to sign a brand new terms of service agreement for Airbnb. That little scroll bar looked a little too small. I decided to do a control A, uh, copy paste the terms of service into Microsoft Word, and then waited about 45 seconds for Microsoft Word to count the number of words. There were 33,000 words amounting to 55 pages in Word for Airbnb terms of service, something I've been using from the beginning and it's pretty damn straightforward. Uh, compared it to some of the other things, the US Constitution is not even 9,000 words. And uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper, in case anyone's curious, is 3,400 words. Uh, I always thought the EU regulation on the sale of cabbage at 27,000 words was pretty bad, but I think Airbnb has a deal. Um, again, this is laws. Like, this is why laws are hard to understand, they're hard to enforce. Uh, this is a piece of regulation that has passed. Anybody want to take a guess what this is that has not seen this presentation in the past? Dodd Frank? No, that is not Dodd Frank. Dodd Frank is significantly smaller. The U.S. tax code. No, that's too small. Uh, what? No, that, they don't have that. Hmm? No, Obamacare. Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is Obamacare. This is why uh, no one can comprehend most of the laws that are happening um, right it's now. Space, uh, also, because of laws in some places in some countries. Uh, companies are preemptive whether they can be enforced or not. So here is Volturo, they sell gold for Bitcoin, and they have a little disclaimer at the bottom, I confirm that I am not a resident of Iran, Syria, North Korea, or the state of New York. What's the difference? Uh, this, is in regard, <laughs> this is in regards to the bit license situation in New York. Uh, I got a few more minutes. So what's gonna happen when people move? This is the population of Rome, historically. And uh, I got this chart from Mark Armstrong's website, who does great work. Uh, so when the government starts taxing too much and the laws get out of control and they can't support the public sector, which back in those days was the Roman military, uh, they come back and sack the city. Today we don't have to worry about the military coming back to the U.S. for several reasons. One, our military is not that big part of our public sector, at least not the people. The weapons, yes, but not the people. Uh, and also too many people in the U.S. have guns. But if you take the entire public sector into account, which is the firemen, the teachers, the policemen, uh, that's a huge public sector that's gonna want their cut of the money when that pension check, the $120 trillion in unfunded liabilities have to be defaulted upon. Um, and this is what happens when public workers decide to sack the city and take back what they're owed, population just drops. The population of Rome fell from 1.5 million to 400 AD and eventually bottomed out at about 17,000, a 98% population in what was considered the greatest city in the world. Uh, and if you look at how the population fell, see that red yellow circle right there? Well, now we're back to our old how bubbles collapse chart. Okay, so everything is pretty much the same. Um, so why is Bitcoin so good? Well, Bitcoin um, is the only asset you can own that is permissionless. Um, it can be controlled, it can be, uh, can be controlled, it can be taxed, uh, technologically anyway, for now. Um, it can't even be noticed if you're handling it properly. And this is why I'm not very bullish on gold, because here's a custom score from a country I blanketed out. It's not really that important. Um, and right there, are you bringing any gold bullion into the country? Are you bringing any gold jewelry above the stated amount? Um, and uh, I don't think they state what the state stated amount is. That's just their prerogative. When I was flying here from Korea two days ago, South Korea, um, I was asked um, at the, um, I was asked right there, turning, uh, showing them my password, the passport. Uh, they didn't say, do I have over $10,000 on me? They asked me straight up, how much cash are you carrying on you? 
and I was wearing pajama pants because I was on a 12, 13 hour flight. I wanted to be comfortable. I'm looking at the guy, I'm like, how much cash do you possibly think I can have? Um, I didn't say that, but I really wanted to say it. Um, but that's what's happening. I mean, they're hunting cash everywhere. And this is what happened in Greece. So this is back in February, like four months before the Greece disaster. Same, same website, same news website, TechCrunch, why Greece should not switch to Bitcoin. And here is two months after the Greek banking shutdown, Bitcoin provider Cubis aims to help uh, Greeks move their money. So this is how you know government thinks and this is how real people think. Uh, so that's how I see Bitcoin. I don't really have the time to get into my predictions. This was uh, one of them where I have a time analysis saying Bitcoin would reverse its trend in uh, June 15, 2015. This was written um, over a year ago now, a year and a half ago. Uh, this happened to ironically correspond to the day Greece banking sector shut down. And that was around this time when the price of Bitcoin took off. I was expecting it to fall lower. I don't have time to talk about why. Uh, this was my original prediction. And uh, since then, uh, Bitcoin has done that. I expected it to fall. Again, I don't have time to get into the details of uh, why those are my views. Um, I write for Brave New Coin. I have a weekly uh, newsletter. It does <coughs> it's under a paywall now. It used to be free. And uh, I think I need to take a breath now. That's my background. Nice job, Tony. This is Thank normally you. a much better right. presentation. All right. So uh, you can follow that guy right there. Follow Michael into the other room if you want to watch the uh, investment uh, session. And if you want to uh, watch the live gate session, it's going to take place in the mirror right now. So we're going to set up for our next speaker. We're going to get his, grab his laptop, get 